Good morning. I will be speaking on the phenotypic spectrum of mitochondrial disease. What is primary mitochondrial disease? These are a heterogeneous group of genetic disorders that arise from over 300 genes in the nuclear and mitochondrial genomes. Due to defective oxidative phosphorylation, hence these disorders are known as diseases of mitochondrial energy production. Symptoms can arise from a single organ only, such as the bone marrow, or from multiple organs, such as the eyes and the brain. They collectively affect 1 in 4,300 people, with onset in any age group, meaning they can manifest in the neonatal period, childhood, or adulthood. The disease course is variable. It is not a linear age-related progression from being presymptomatic to symptomatic as occurs in many other inherited disorders. In some, the disease course may be progressive over time. In others, disease stability is maintained over very many years. And in some, there is disease fluctuation, which tends to occur with acute intercurrent illness. The symptoms of mitochondrial disease can arise from any organ in the body as depicted in this picture. Most often, it is the organs with the highest energy demand that is affected, including the brain and the heart, the liver, and the kidney. Skeletal muscle is the second largest organ in the body, second to skin. It is not surprising, therefore, that muscle tends to be affected in the majority of patients with mitochondrial disease, followed closely by the gastrointestinal system. In a survey of 290 individuals with primary mitochondrial disease, subjects reported an average number of 16, that's one six symptoms per individual. This really highlights the incredible significant burden of primary mitochondrial diseases. When we asked which were the commonest symptoms that they experienced, the top five included muscle weakness, fatigue, exercise intolerance and imbalance, all originating from muscle, and gastrointestinal symptoms. These exact same top five symptoms were reported as the most prioritized symptoms that would motivate an individual to participate in a clinical trial. Moving on now to specific mitochondrial syndromes, Lay syndrome is the commonest mitochondrial syndrome of childhood. The description is one of onset of neurodevelopmental regression in childhood which is typically triggered by intercurrent illness following a period of normal development. Here are some examples of patients who have presented with Lay syndrome following a period of typical development with onset of hypotonia and muscle weakness, respiratory failure, nystagmus, and seizures in some. The criteria for making a diagnosis of Lay syndrome requires the cardinal features on brain MRI scan, which are the bilateral, typically symmetric, T2-weighted hyperintensities on MRI in the basal ganglia, the thalami, and or the brainstem. We know of over 90 genetic etiologies associated with Lay syndrome in the nuclear and mitochondrial genomes. If we look at the group of disorders of respiratory chain defects, Complex 1 is the largest complex of the five complexes in the respiratory chain. This gene, NDUFB1, encodes a subunit of complex 1. It is known to be associated with Lay syndrome and associated with the typical MRI changes, uh, that being bilateral basal ganglia involvement uh, that is consistent with Lay syndrome. Here, I have presented three different patients who share the same homozygous variant in NDUFB1. All of them presented following a period of normal development and with subsequent neurodevelopmental regression at different ages um, between patients one, two, and three, three being the oldest. In patient one, there was psychomotor regression and ptosis. Patient two had more of a dysarthria and spasticity phenotype. And patient three had nystagmus and cerebellar signs of dystidocokinesia and ataxia, indicating different parts of the brain leading to specific phenotypes. Now moving on to a group of mitochondrial protein translation defects, FARS2 being one of the genes. FARS2 encodes phenylalanine tRNA synthetase, 
Here I have presented three patients, two of which were published, and the third patient three was a patient we see in clinic. All of these patients presented with neurodevelopmental regression and carry the typical MRI changes, which are symmetric, bilateral, basal ganglia, and or brainstem changes on their MRI. When you look at the ages of presentation, all of these were early, though one of them was typically particularly um, early at one month of age. However, they all have slightly different phenotypes at presentation. Patient one presented with weakness and seizures. Patient two presented later in the, at the age of six with spasticity and extrapyramidal movements. Patient three presented at 19 months of age with acute encephalopathy, motor regression, and significant neurologic deficits, um, which fortunately vastly improved over a period of time. All three patients carried compound heterozygous variants in the FARS2 gene. This is an autosomal recessive condition. Next, I would like to move on to describe the clinical phenotype in patients with mitochondrial DNA disease. But first, we need to review the key concepts of mtDNA inheritance. It is maternally inherited. Mitochondrial DNA codes for polypeptides that form the respiratory chain. It is important to note that healthy humans harbor low levels of mitochondrial DNA point mutations over time, hence aging is a form of mitochondrial disease. In patients with mtDNA disease, the increased burden of acquired mutations likely contribute to late onset disease. The concept of heteroplasmy is important to understand. Um, mtDNA mutations affect only a fraction of the mtDNA copies in every cell. This gives rise to a level, so a heteroplasmy level that is measured in different tissues, as I will show you in our subsequent slides. This degree of heteroplasmy determines the expression of symptoms in a given tissue and likely gives rise or explains the extensive clinical heterogeneity of mtDNA disease and possibly the age of onset. Heterogeneity within the same family members harboring the same mutation is often observed in mtDNA disease. Now I'd like to move on to describe specific mitochondrial disease syndromes. Historically, a clinical diagnosis of mitochondrial disease, for example, MILAS, was made based on pattern recognition of a specific constellation of symptoms, supported by biochemical evidence of mitochondrial dysfunction or muscle biopsy. Syndromes related to mitochondrial DNA point mutations include MILAS, which is mitochondrial encephalomyopathy, lactic acidosis and stroke, MRF, myoclonic epilepsy and ragged red fibers, NARP, neuropathy, ataxia and retinitis pigmentosa. Also, there are syndromes related to a single large mtDNA deletion, which is on a spectrum, including chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, or CPEO, and the single large-scale mtDNA deletion disorders constitute about 10% of all primary mitochondrial disorders. This was, in fact, one of the first mtDNA genetic defects to be reported um, to be associated with human disease. The syndromes lie along a spectrum from Pearson to CPO and cairn sayre syndrome. Pearson's is a very severe uh, disease phenotype. It is um, typified by transfusion-dependent sideroblastic anemia, along with lactic acidosis, poor growth, and exocrine pancreatic dysfunction. The slide shows you the ring sideroblast that one can see on a blood film. If the individual survives, they may be converted into the other syndromes, the mildest of which is PEO, or progressive external ophthalmoplegia. In this syndrome, there's involvement of the eyes only, with some mild involvement of the limb muscles. CPEO plus is now an extension of the eye and muscle involvement into other organs. And the most severe one is cairn sayre syndrome. Here, patients have PEO, Onset needs to be under age 20, with pigmentary retinopathy, as shown in the slide, with other features, including heart conduction defects, um, the most severe one being a heart block that warrants a pacemaker to be inserted, um, or ataxia. The detection of the single large-scale deletion needs to be in the affected tissue. Therefore, one can identify it in blood or bone marrow in the Pearson stage, but and the other syndromes more typically is identified in muscle tissue. Now sharing with you some cases of mtDNA phenotypes. 
This young lady presented at the age of 26 years with lifelong exercise intolerance in muscle pain, fatigable ptosis, so that's droopy eyelids, which were worse towards the end of the day or when tired, frequent headaches, a long history of dysphagia and abdominal pain, and endocrine problems. She presented to a neurologist who performed a muscle biopsy that showed the retrograde fibers in this image here, uh, along with muscle electron transport chain assay that proved to be normal, so there was no evidence of a respiratory chain defect. However, genetic testing, which included whole exome sequencing and mitochondrial DNA sequencing in blood, also were normal. The tissue underwent muscle mitochondrial DNA sequencing and revealed the common melas mutation, 3243, at a high level heteroplasmian muscle at 67%. Interestingly, there was, this was not identified in blood. We tested her urine subsequently and this was at a low level heteroplasmia at 7%. Therefore, this highlights the need for testing in affected tissues and in her it was muscle. In this next case, this young, young man presented at the age of 12 with a long history of delayed early milestones, exercise intolerance, and progressive muscle weakness, which was mild at presentation. It was the ophthalmologist who identified concern for a single DNA deletion disorder given the uh, bilateral ptosis and ophthalmoplegia. He also had a history of migraines and a short stature as well as chronic GI problems. In him, the genetic testing uh, included whole exome sequencing and mitochondrial DNA sequencing in blood, which were negative. However, the muscle biopsy revealed Cox negative fibers shown in this top image here and subsacroline mitochondria in the image below. The muscle mitochondrial function tested by ETC assay, electron transport actually was normal. But the muscle anti-DNA quantitation was elevated at 233% indicating a compensatory increase. In him, the muscle mitochondrial DNA sequencing revealed a single large deletion, which was not identified in blood. Therefore, these cases really highlight the tissue specificity of mitochondrial DNA disease and the importance of testing the right tissue, which needs to be the affected tissue. To describe further cases of empty DNA disease, this young man presented at the age of 17 years of age with seizures and motor regression, rendering him now wheelchair dependent. Mitochondrial DNA sequencing in tissues revealed a complex 1 mitochondrial ND3 mutation um, that varied in heteroplasmy levels depending on the tissue tested. So it was 44% in blood, 42% in skin, but 78% in buccal swab. This signifies the importance of testing several different tissues, particularly if you're trying to confirm the pathogenicity of the variant that has been identified. The next patient was age 47, who presented in her 20s with progressive weakness, seizures, migraines, and a history of metabolic strokes, along with sensory neural hearing loss. In her, Initially, mitochondrial DNA sequencing identified the common mutation of 3243 at only 8% heteroplasmy levels in blood. So this was very low. That would be 92% normal mitochondrial DNA compared to 8% mutant mitochondrial DNA in their cells. Her mother, who was symptomatic with type 2 diabetes, also carried a very low level um, heteroplasmy of 6% in blood. Subsequent testing of her urine confirmed a higher level of 3243 at 66%, hence confirmed the diagnosis of MILAS in her. These cases, again, highlight the importance of understanding tissue specificity of mitochondrial disease. Now moving on to the mitochondrial DNA depletion syndromes. These are caused by nuclear genes that are involved in mitochondrial DNA replication and maintenance, and therefore with autosomal recessive disorders. In the first case, a five-year-old boy presented with long-standing failure to thrive and rapid progressive loss of motor milestones, hypotonia with dysphagia. 
Given the very myopathic phenotype, he had a plasma CK value drawn, which was within normal limits at 299. Uh, a value in the thousands would have raised concern for a muscular dystrophy such as Duchenne muscular dystrophy. His genetic testing revealed novel homozygous mutations in a gene called TK2. And the variants were subsequently confirmed as being biparentally inherited, meaning one copy from mom and one copy from dad. In order to understand the effect of these mutations, we had a muscle biopsy performed where his uh, pathology was abnormal and showed ragged blue fibers in the image on the left and Cox negative fibers in the image on the right. His muscle electron transport chain showed a 50% reduction in mitochondria complex 4 with normal activities of the other complexes and a normal citrate synthase value. Muscle mitochondrial DNA content was not performed at the time, but was likely performed later in another institution that confirmed mitochondrial DNA depletion. Mitochondrial thymidine kinase phosphorylates the pyrimidine nucleosides thymidine and deoxycytidine. So the problem with this disorder is that low levels of nucleotides are not, are, um, therefore are not available for mitochondrial DNA synthesis. There is currently a form of investigational treatment for this condition in the form of nucleoside replacement therapy. In case 2, this was an 18-year-old young lady who presented with a peripheral sensory motor neuropathy that rapidly progressed in the first year of presentation. Um, and just to give you insight, uh, she was referred to the neuromuscular clinic for a diagnosis of Chaco-Marie tooth or CMT. However, the rapid progression was very much not in keeping with a CMT disorder. And in fact, she had a CMT panel tested uh, for genetic diagnosis, which did not reveal a CMT genetic etiology. Going into her background, there was a history of transient transaminitis or abnormal liver function that was mild but persistent, as well as hypoglycemia with intercurrent illness. On exam, and on exam she had a good muscle strength, except at the distal muscles, particularly in the feet, which were weak as a result of the peripheral neuropathy. When we um, had assessments performed on all other organs, these revealed bilateral sensory neural hearing loss, uh, her MRI brain was normal, but the MRS revealed lactic acidosis, and because of the abnormal liver function, we performed liver imaging, which revealed nodules in her liver, along with elevated alpha-beta-protein. Her genetic testing revealed novel heterozygous variants in the MPV17 gene, uh, which is a nuclear gene involved in mtDNA replication and repair. Um, she had subsequent muscle biopsy performed, uh, which was remarkably normal on histopathology and electron microscopy, as well as the electron transport chain testing, and the mtDNA quantitation was entirely normal. Some year or two later, she subsequently had a liver biopsy. Here, we were able to quantify the mtDNA content, which was now decreased at 15% of normal values. So the MPV17 gene encodes an inner membrane protein that is involved in the maintenance of mitochondrial DNA. The first mitochondrial DNA depletion syndrome to be described was Alpers syndrome. This is a hepatocerebral syndrome. Um, the earlier case of the young lady with the MPV17 variant, too, is more typically a hepatocerebral uh, syndrome. Um, however, she had a very different phenotype of uh, predominant uh, sensory motor axonal neuropathy. And so really it just um, uh, reminds us how uh, broad and heterogeneous the clinical phenotype can be, uh, even within the same genotype. So in this case, um, there was a family history of an older brother who died with hepatocerebral degeneration, so liver involvement and brain involvement. And the index patient here was normal at birth, um, then had a degenerative event at 18 months of age during an intercurrent illness uh, and was hypoglycemic. He subsequently had six more bouts of episodic decompensation over the following two years that unfortunately led to further loss of milestones uh, resulting in the inability to walk or speak. He subsequently developed epilepsy partialis continua and died of uh, hepatic um, dysfunction at the age of three and a half. Uh, Bob Navio 
uh, UC San Diego subsequently identified Paul Gama as being the gene responsible for Alto syndrome, which is autosomal recessive a condition. This pathology here is very typical in the liver cells um, and a pathologic diagnosis can be made uh, on postmortem and this was um, how the diagnosis was confirmed prior to the uh, availability of genetic diagnosis. Moving on to a less common uh, mitochondrial syndrome, this is mitochondrial neurogastrointestinal encephalopathy or meningi that presents with a very predominant GI symptoms, a very predominant GI phenotype. So this is very important syndrome for GI physicians uh, to be aware of. So this patient was uh, 19 at the time when he presented with abdominal pain and weight loss. However, the history was protracted um, and had been there since age three. He'd had multiple hospital admissions and multiple GI physician workup. Um, at the age of 19, he had a low BMI of 16.5 and on close exam was found to have bilateral ptosis and ophthalmoplegia. He had low muscle bulk but normal strength, surprisingly. However, had reduced vibration and proprioception. This is reduced sensation consistent with a peripheral neuropathy. Um, his uh, hospital admission revealed uh, a very massive uh, distended stomach on abdominal x-ray. The CT scan here with the arrows show uh, the thickening of the bowel walls. Anyway, a diagnosis of pseudo-obstruction was made um, and um, someone thought of doing a brain MRI despite having normal cognition um, where extensive white matter changes consistent with asymptomatic leukodystrophy was identified and this is when the penny dropped that he likely had a mitochondrial disorder. In fact, his thymidine phosphorylase enzyme activity was absent. His TYMP gene sequencing confirmed the diagnosis um, and the um, a condition is an autosomal recessive condition. It is relentlessly progressive. It is one of the most severe mitochondrial syndromes, and it is due to a deficiency of thymidine phosphorylase, which impairs mitochondrial DNA replication due to the imbalance of the nucleoside pools. The investigational therapies that are available and being studied include enzyme replacement and liver and stem cell transplant. In our clinic here at CHOP, we work with Jean Flickinger, an experienced neuromuscular physician who has mapped out the distribution of muscle weakness in our patients, child and adult, in clinic um, in uh, the upper extremities as shown in the graph on the left and the lower extremity shown in the graph on the right. The data is presented as z-scores, uh, meaning uh, mean z-scores of the group compared to uh, normative data that was available in the general population. Anything minus two and below was considered abnormal. What I've done here is uh, put red boxes around the muscle groups that were particularly weak and surprisingly so we discovered that not only were the proximal muscle weak but also the distal muscle groups including the wrists and the pinch in the upper extremities and the ankles in the lower extremities. This was a big surprise because uh, historically mitochondrial myopathy is known as a proximal muscle weakness disorder, uh, but it turns out patients also have distal muscle weakness. In the last couple of slides, I just want to share the phenotype of muscle involvement in mitochondrial disease. So here's another example of a person with uh, mitochondrial DNA large deletion. And um, this lady presented to us in her 60s with a history of um, lifelong symptoms consistent with Cairnsair syndrome onset in her 20s, including PEO, muscle weakness, heart conduction defect, ataxia, and deafness. She carried a clinical diagnosis in her lifetime, but did not have a laboratory confirmation of the single large-scale deletion. Um, and the motivation to have it was for her participation in a clinical trial. We then were able to perform, uh, in fact, a needle muscle biopsy in her under local anesthesia, which confirmed the 5KB common deletion. So this is another reminder of the slide earlier that I showed whereby mtDNA disorders need to be evaluated for in the appropriate tissue. And in her, for Karim Sayre, this was muscle tissue. So the need to perform a muscle biopsy doesn't just stop at patients with mtDNA disorders. It can be relevant in those with nuclear genetic etiologies, particularly to identify um, uh, functional abnormalities of mitochondria, 
and muscle tissue, um, and in this case was needed when the variant identified was novel. So this young lady presented at the age of 12 with ataxia, developmental delay in dysarthria, exercise intolerance, and early onset optic atrophy and sensory neural hearing loss. As mentioned, the uh, whole exome sequencing revealed a de novo variant uh, that we didn't fully understand. The AFG3L2 is a patelloprotease family gene that is responsible for protein quality control and assembly of mitochondrial ribosomes and respiratory chain complexes. She subsequently underwent a muscle uh, biopsy of which the muscle histopathology uh, was normal. And the muscle mitochondrial DNA sequencing too was normal, which excluded uh, empty DNA cause for her symptoms. However, the muscle electron transport chain revealed combined uh, complex deficiencies. This then enabled us to confirm the pathogenicity of her novel variant. We perform needle biopsies here um, in place of uh, open muscle biopsies, uh, the benefit of which uh, allows avoidance of general anesthesia, fasting, um, and ensures proper specimen. To review the range of abnormalities seen in muscle in patients with mitochondrial disease, uh, these include, uh, as shown earlier in the patient cases, ragged red fibers on trichrome stain, rich stains blue on SDH stain, um, as well as cytochrome oxidase negative fibers on mitochondrial complex 4 cytochrome oxidase staining. This um, becomes more prominent when you co-stain the muscle with uh, cox staining as well as SDH, and there's the blue stained cox negative fibers that tends to represent mitochondrial DNA disease. In addition to uh, histopathology, we perform electron microscopy here on a routine basis at CHOP for all patients with suspected mitochondrial disease. These are examples of what is observed in patients with mitochondrial disease. The mitochondria are giant, there's concentric cristae, um, and this was uh, images were kindly provided by our pathologist here, Dr. Bayan. It's important to understand that the mitochondrial disease phenotype that I've just described is incredibly burdensome. And so we conducted a study interviewing patients, um, asking them how their symptoms affected their daily life. Um, in their own statements, exercise intolerance was reported as felt like my battery needed to be recharged. In terms of fatigue, if I need to get groceries, it can put me in bed for two to three days. So we conducted a, a qualitative analysis uh, on their statements. Here you'll see the graphs presenting the activities of daily living that is impacted, which includes um, socializing, hobbies, going to work, going up the stairs and bathing. Uh, as well as the uh, big reliance on others to get these ADLs done. So the uh, take-home message is mitochondrial disease is indeed extremely burdensome. In conclusion, primary mitochondrial disease is highly clinically and genetically heterogeneous. The age of onset too is very variable, even within families. Symptoms vary from single organ to multi-organ involvement, and this can change over time, which is why systematic Close monitoring in all patients with mitochondrial disease is essential. Heightened awareness of the likelihood of a diagnosis of mitochondrial disease expedites the diagnosis, which is subsequently confirmed by genetic testing. Thank you very much.